purpose of today's press conference is to discuss uh, in a little bit of detail the findings of the Senate Expungement Reform Study Committee. Uh, the study committee was formed pursuant to Senate Resolution 247. First of all, I want to thank the members of the committee, uh, Senator Hardy Davis, Senator Butch Miller, Senator Ronald Ramsey, and Senator Jesse Stone, uh, who all did great work, uh, had a, all have a lot of passion for this issue. Uh, and I think what we learned during this whole process is this is definitely one issue uh, that does, there's no partisan divide, there's no racial divide. Uh, it's something that we all share a great concern about. We had four uh, public hearings uh, starting in September and the most recent one being on December the 11th. Uh, we heard a great deal of testimony uh, from state agencies, uh, from folks in the uh, third party commercial data business that provide background checks to employers. Uh, we had uh, background uh, from employers as well. Uh, we also heard from uh, the Georgia, the Just Georgia Project, um, as well as a number of other uh, nonprofit organizations and uh, average ordinary uh, Georgians who have found themselves uh, sort of caught up in the web uh, that is our current expungement law. And uh, we came up with some findings, which I want to just briefly go over with you today. Uh, the first one, and in my view, the most significant one, is that there are very significant problems with the information technology systems that are being utilized throughout this process. If you think about uh, a criminal charge from beginning to end, uh, there's an arrest made, a booking uh, occurs in a county jail or a city jail, uh, there is then a prosecution process that goes through our court system. Uh, and then finally, uh, there is a, a conviction or a disposition. And uh, the person could wind up in our state prison system. Each one of those systems uh, uses a different uh, computer system. They use different software. Uh, the software, the testimony we heard was that the software generally does not translate across systems. So the information has to be input uh, repeatedly uh, by each agency. And even when you get through with that entire process, there's one more step, which is to report uh, the final disposition of the case to the Georgia Crime Information Center, the GCIC, uh, which is the official repository of records. And what we've learned is that there's a very large percentage, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of dispositions are not present. Um, and, and there are also inaccuracies, and those inaccuracies can almost all be uh, directly translated to this problem of having to re-input data over and over again. And I would submit that it is not a good use of our clerk's time or our prosecutor's time to be uh, uh, essentially functioning as data entry clerks. Um, we need to have an information technology system that goes across the entire platform uh, from the county jail, to the courts, to the prison system, to GCIC. Um, is that going to be expensive? Probably. Um, is it something that, frankly, should be part, uh, in my view, of a statewide uh, reform of how information technology is used in courts entirely? Yes, uh, both on the civil side as well as the criminal side. I will say that we've had some discussion um, about how we would fund something like that. And I think that there are really two mechanisms we could look to. On the civil side, um, we could do what a lot of other states have done and add an information technology fee so that when a civil complaint is filed by a litigant, they pay that additional information technology fee, which could flow into a fund uh, that would eventually allow us to roll this out statewide. On the criminal side, understanding that not every criminal case the fines generated can be paid, but we certainly could have an add-on fine uh, that could go into information technology, as many localities do today with technology fees in recorder's court and uh, courts of ordinary jurisdiction. So that, to me, is the number one problem here that we've got to address long-term is information technology. Secondly, there are omissions and inconsistencies throughout the criminal history records maintained by key stakeholders. And again, that goes back to the information technology issue. If, if we didn't have to repeat the entries, we would not have the inconsistencies and the gaps. Um, we found that the process for obtaining expungement or restriction of records for certain nonviolent offenses should be simplified. 
Current Georgia state law requires you to go to the arresting agency. It requires you to go to the original sentencing judge. And it also requires you to go to the prosecutorial agency. Uh, this is very difficult. It, it essentially, for a layman, uh, requires legal assistance. And uh, that should not be uh, the standard. We should be making it easier for people who have paid their debt to society to navigate this process. And the state of Georgia should take steps to encourage the hiring of individuals with criminal histories who have demonstrated good behavior. Um, you know, we've looked at a lot of different ideas, uh, a lot of different reforms that could potentially move in that direction, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Uh, reporting of certain types of information by background check and criminal history providers can negatively impact an individual's ability to secure housing and employment. One of the greatest problems we heard about in testimony before the committee was that a lot of the third party vendors, because of the inconsistent information out there, will sometimes wind up reporting information that was already supposed to be expunged from the system. And perhaps it was expunged at the GCIC level, but not in the sheriff's office where the arrest occurred, or perhaps not in the official court record that the clerk is maintaining. So what you wind up having is erroneous, uh, sometimes inaccurate uh, information being reported that is providing an unfair bar to employment and housing. So based on those findings, we made uh, several different recommendations. Uh, the first of these is that the state of Georgia should study the cost and feasibility of making a significant investment in the upgrade and standardization of information technology systems uh, that are utilized for the criminal justice process. Again, it seems fairly uh, uh, simple, although perhaps expensive, to implement a solution. And we heard testimony from a representative from Hewlett Packard, uh, a, a representative from Hewlett Packard who was formerly the chief clerk of the Cook County uh, court system in uh, Chicago, Illinois, who talked about California, Illinois, other jurisdictions implementing these beginning to end information technology solutions. So they're out there. Uh, we're not uh, breaking new ground in doing this. We, again, would have to make a significant investment. But again, the, the, be the benefit that could be reaped from that, uh, I think, is tremendous. We need to identify certain criminal offenses for which records will be restricted by operation of law. Uh, and the idea here is that there would be certain offenses, and, and I'll make some suggestions that are in the recommendations here, nonviolent offenses, minor drug offenses that did not involve violence, weapons possession, or possession of distribution quantities of controlled substances. I mean, those are certainly, uh, I think, offenses we could all agree on. And what would happen upon conviction, obviously there would be a sentence. Once that individual uh, followed the sentence and then uh, also sat out a, a period of time, almost a probationary period, without reoffending, then the state of Georgia would notify the prosecutor, we are going to expunge this offense in the next 30, 60 days unless you object. So we're kind of flipping that burden. So no longer is it the offender who's having to jump through all these hoops, but rather the prosecuting authority is having to have the burden to explain why that record needs to stay on the books. Um, and, and Indiana has a model for this. Uh, back in 2013, they adopted uh, a statute that says, very simply, once the record becomes eligible for restriction, that the restriction will be granted without a court hearing unless the prosecutor objects. Now, if we're able to couple this method of expungement with a, a across-the-board technology solution, uh, we could, I think, revolutionize the way these expungements occur and put people on a fast track to rebuilding their lives uh, after making a single mistake, uh, committing a nonviolent crime. Uh, we want to put them in a position to rebuild their lives, and I think these two recommendations together can do that. With limited exceptions, the state of Georgia should consider the adoption of restrictions on the use of questions in applications for housing and employment related to an applicant's criminal history. I want to be clear about this. Employers and landlords should be limited to asking questions only about criminal convictions that have not been formally expunged or restricted. Because frankly, what is the purpose of expungement if you have to answer the question in the affirmative about a criminal history? Uh, so we don't want to prevent employers or landlords from seeking that information if it's still on the books, but we also don't want to make a, make a liar out of someone who uh, has gone through the process and done what they're supposed to do. Uh, these restrictions would not apply 
to employers who are screening applicants for certain positions of public trust, and those would include law enforcement, health, elder, or child care, people that are coming in contact with vulnerable populations. But otherwise, uh, we would put that in place. So I would describe that as sort of a limited ban the box. We're not getting rid of the question, but we're narrowing the scope of that question. With limited exceptions, the state of Georgia should adopt uniform standards for all state agencies and departments regarding the use of an applicant's criminal history. What we learned is that there's almost as many different standards as there are state agencies in terms of looking at the criminal history. Uh, you know, your criminal history may allow you to work at DCH, but not at DCA. And, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. Again, we think there ought to be a carve out for those folks that are dealing with uh, vulnerable populations and public safety, but outside of that, there really ought to be a uniform, predictable model so people understand who are applying for state employment to do that. And I think the state should be leading in setting a standard that private industry can then look at uh, as a potential model to follow. Uh, we believe uh, also uh, as a recommendation that the Georgia Open Records Act uh, should be amended to exclude information gathered in a suspect's initial booking following arrest, including mugshot photos. We had some very compelling testimony at our very first hearing about an individual uh, who's working at a Fortune 500 company here in the Atlanta area. Uh, there was a case of mistaken identity and she was placed under arrest. Uh, someone else in her apartment building skipped a cab fare. She wound up being arrested by the Atlanta po uh, Police Department. They actually came into her place of business uh, arrested her there at the scene uh, of her employment, marched her out of her place of employment. Uh, she had to hire an attorney, uh, establish the fact that there was a case of mistaken identity here. Um, but even after all of that, that all happened, I believe, almost a year prior to our hearing. And at the time that her father came forward to testify, her record still had not been cleared. And if you did a Google search of this young lady's name, you could find her mugshot photo. Um, and so, while we want to balance very carefully the public's right to know, uh, we do think until you get further along in that process of prosecution, perhaps upon a showing a probable cause, or something of that nature, uh, there ought to be some protection granted to folks because obviously once these things are published online, they're there forever. They're very difficult to get rid of. Uh, finally, we believe that the state of Georgia should create a private cause of action in favor of individuals whose criminal records obtained by a third-party background check provider inaccurately or unlawfully report to potential employers or landlords. Uh, I think that really that's the only way we're going to get at this uh, problem. Uh, there are a lot of good actors, and I want to be very clear that the testimony we receive from a lot of these third-party vendors, they're doing everything the appropriate way. They have a certification process at the national level. Uh, to encourage best practices, but frankly, it is kind of the Wild West. There's not a lot of regulation in place. And rather than create a new state agency, rather than expand government to try to enforce this, what we would rather do is give the individual a way uh, to seek redress in the, uh, in the civil court system, and I believe it will only take a few of those cases to dramatically reduce the abuses that are currently occurring. Um, so those are really the findings and recommendations of the committee. Uh, we believe that um, we have a real opportunity in Georgia to move uh, our law forward by quantum leap. Uh, we are lagging behind the rest of the nation in this area. There have been some important reforms as part of the governor's prior criminal justice reform packages, and we certainly acknowledge that, uh, as well as the work of the criminal justice uh, reform uh, committee that has been meeting uh, this year, but we feel strongly that these findings and recommendations really get at the heart of the problem, uh, and if we can get some legislation uh, along with administrative action to carry out these recommendations, we'll go a long way uh, towards allowing the many, many Georgians who are otherwise eligible and ready, to, ready for work to get back to work, and uh, with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. carry out some of these recommendations? Uh, we don't have any bills prepared yet. Um, I am working on uh, a couple of things uh, that would address uh, the private right of action as well as the uh, um, the limiting of the question, uh, the sort of the limited ban the box. I think that, again, the biggest piece of this, uh, which I believe is the information technology piece, is something that, frankly, is going to require a lot of buy-in from a number of stakeholders. Uh, I think that's going to be a lengthier process and something that, uh, frankly, we're going to need uh, cooperation from the clerks, the sheriffs, uh, the GBI, um, a lot of different people that are involved in the system. And I will tell you from the testimony that we heard 
I think there's pretty broad agreement this is a good solution. It's just a question of where do you find the resources to, uh, to allow this. I mean, we, we have everything in this state from, uh, 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 from uh, courts that are fully automated uh, to courts that have, uh, uh, you know, boxes in, in a room somewhere with the information all on paper. And so uh, we, we need to bring all this into line and get some kind of reliability uh, in the in the process, and and that to me is the biggest ticket item in this whole package. I think so because you know since we don't have a uh, a unified judicial system and we, and we have all all of these different uh, clerks that uh, might have different ideas about what an information technology solution would look like, you know we need a a structure to bring all of them together. Um, and get an agreement on what that would look like so that everybody could get into the system. And I can tell you, uh, as somebody who practices law in Alabama and Georgia, um, it is night and day um, in, in Alabama, you have a fully electronic system and you have portals for different people. So for example, one of the, one of the big issues that clerks brought to us is, we don't want to alter court records because that's the official record. We don't want to do anything to alter that. Well, if it's all electronic, then you can have a clerk's portal that gives you full access to everything, but then you could also have a public portal that if you go to a, a terminal at the system or hopefully maybe one day even online from anywhere, you would get only the things that you would be granted permission to get as a, as a, as a public uh, access point. And then attorneys would have a different access, prosecutors would have a different access. So it can be solved, I think, through that uh, that sort of process. Well, it sounds like a lot of the things you're trying to do here are a logical extension of the uh, criminal justice sentencing reform we've had the last couple of years. Have you had a chance to talk to the governor about this, or has he expressed an opinion one way or the other on this issue? We, I'm certainly looking forward to continuing conversation directly with the governor. We had the uh, Thomas Worthy from the Criminal Justice Reform Council testified before our committee. We certainly have been watching very carefully what they have been doing. Um, but I do think it's the natural extension because it's all well and good for us to be in a, in a situation where people are not being warehoused in prisons for years and years that frankly shouldn't be. But if we, if we uh, find that person guilty of a felony and essentially it's a scarlet letter they've got to wear for the rest of their life, you know, we can't be surprised if there's recidivism if there's no way for them to climb the economic ladder. So I think that these are the logical next steps in my view. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.